So, and I know you all, so <laughs> just hang out and I love uh, Andy's work because it's like so, like, you know, uh, archival. All right, more and all, uh, basically, um, I'm here to do a presentation on Francisco Pancho Madonna. Uh, a lot you are in politics, which is a curious and bold statement that he said. However, this quote does an excellent job of summarizing his life, a life of struggle determined to forge unity, to demand respect, and to fight for the rights of all. In this presentation, I will sketch this life out. At the beginning, he faced difficulties that could have easily made him a statistic, but with the coming of war, opportunities, and more importantly, the Union, it uh, allowed uh, him to use his skills to do just what he would achieve. The rights of many were equal to the rights of one. Madame Grano did not hesitate to cross racial and social lines to press for freedoms. In the end, he returned to Dallas to grow a fledgling Mexican-American identity and to further opportunities for all. Now, Francisco Pancho Medrano was born in Dallas on October 2nd, 1920. Like many of his Tejano neighbors in Little Mexico, Sabas and Nicolas Ruiz Franco Medrano had fled from the Mexican Revolution three years prior. The, bar, the barrio he lived in was a rail and industrial center. His world contained unpaved streets with houses that had no electricity, hot water, or even indoor plumbing. In segregated Dallas, Hispanics were refused service in restaurants and faced other forms of discrimination. Indeed, it was not until 1931 when Mexican Americans were finally allowed to use the swimming pool in the nearby Pike Park. Of course, they were only allowed to swim for a brief time before the water was changed so that the white children could swim for the rest of the day. Before entering, the children had to pick up rocks or glass in the park, and their bodies had to be checked for sores and their hair for piojos or leandres, lice or nets. Though Poncho began his first grade at St. Anne's Catholic School, it took him more than 10 years to graduate to the seventh grade. Like more than 100,000 Tejano families, he would have to take off periods to labor as migrant workers, picking apples and beets in faraway states from Michigan to Indiana. In 1937, he enrolled at Crozier Tech Vocational School. The day prior, his mother had sacrificed to get Poncho the best secondhand clothes she could afford from the Salvation Army. But on his first day, uh, which was also his last, an administrator told Poncho that his clothes were unacceptable. Madrono left education to take a mindless and menial job at a rock quarry. There he may have fallen into obscurity, becoming nothing more than a statistic, yet the man a manager, remembered only as Jim, gave him uh, the address of a war training school in Dallas. When he showed up at the interview, his skill with the jigsaw won him a new position under the Works Progress Administration in the North American uh, aviation and garden. At this plant, Medrano began his dance with Destiny. On his very first day, Medrano became known for his boxing. Uh, Medrano had learned to box at the Asociación Católica de Jovines, or the Catholic Youth Association, since he was 13 years old. To help build morale, the company held boxing matches during lunch. With a domineering six foot, two inch frame, Medrano made a formidable sight. Within a week, Medrano recalled that there were thousands of people watching him box. And when he won his bouts, he was proudly reported in the papers as a Dallas boy. And when he lost, he was the outsider. <laughs> Concurrent with his battles in boxing, Medrano began to attend union meetings held at the Old City Park. He recalled that on the front of the union pamphlets, it always said that in the union there is no discrimination, or to Medrano, whatever you get, the other person gets. Medrano joined the United Automobiles Workers Union, Local 645, at the North American Aviation. Unions, however, were not welcome to the Dallas elite. Uh, indeed, at the mere rumor of a union organization of the Dallas War Plan, a private police force was organized that kidnapped more than 50 people, 
crippled a dozen, blinded one man, and killed another during their anti-union campaign. Shortly after joining the UAW, Medrano was fired from North American Aviation, but he was almost immediately hired by the union. Do we go there? Yeah, no, we'll go there. Uh, Medrano energy and infatigable spirit caught the uh, eye of UAW president Walter Ruther. This would become a crucial decision at, at a pivotal moment in history. And by the way, Walter Ruther is really cool. And by the way, uh, a really unreported section in labor history is the union's involvement in the advancement of civil rights. Um, that is really a virgin territory to anybody who wants to have fun in a right to work state studying unions. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, Walter Ruther, with assistance from his brothers, Roy and Victor, had founded the UAW in 1936. The UAW was formed under the Committee for Industrial Organizations, a partner of the American Federation of Labor. And the CIO, unlike the AFL, which mainly focused on trades, uh, aggressively recruited in the large factories. Through Ruther's leadership, the UAW climbed to a membership of 30,000 members in one year. His leadership style and approach was confrontational and abrasive. Fearlessly, his sit-down strike at the General Motors plant in Flint, Michigan led to a stabilization of hours and increase in wages. Politically, as President Franklin Roosevelt supported the unions, Walter in turn threw his support behind the Democrats. And socially, Ruther fought for an increase in inclusion of employment opportunities for minorities in the UAW. With the conclusion of World War II, his want for inclusion only accelerated, and after meeting Medrano, an impressed Ruther told Medrano, we need somebody like you, and with fearless charisma, Medrano became a tireless recruiter and an advocate for civil rights. Although his early efforts to uh, raise awareness in Dallas were stymied, Medrano fought for civil rights in Georgia, Mississippi, and Alabama. Under the authority of the UAW in 1955, he traveled to the Montgomery bus boycott and helped organize the gasoline uh, and carpool detail for the protest. He was also present at the protest in Selma, Alabama, where he received the hoses and the dogs, brutal, uh, the brutality treatment that marchers received courtesy of police chief Eugene Bull Connor. Medrano became so adroit at organizing the UAW, he was even sent to the Dominican Republic in 1958 and 1960 to offer political education to the citizens. <clears throat> Before he had time to rest, Medrano was called to California to help out Cesar Chavez, a young migrant la labor organizer whose United Farm Workers had been chartered by the AFL-CIO. Medrano was dispatched and, and worked to collect more than 3,000 protesters from the largely Filipino labor community. The magnitude of his num uh, numbers defeated the threat of incarceration and helped focus national attention on Chavez and the UFW. Beyond building the membership of workers, Medrano also wisely built political connections that uh, reached as high as Robert Kennedy and his brother Edward, Ted Kennedy. Robert Kennedy fought for the rights of the UFW in California during the uh, Delano Grape Strike, 1965 to 1970, where workers shouting Wega strike refused to pick grapes until wages were raised. Robert Kennedy displayed his solidarity with Cesar Chavez in a meeting held on March 16, 1966. This allegiance was the first support the UFW had received from a national candidate, an alliance so strong that it would endure even after Robert's assassination on June 6, 1908. Come on in. By that time, however, Medrano was back in Texas. 
Now, the goal of unionizing migrant workers in Texas seemed an impossible task. In the tumultuous years of 1966 to 1967, only one with the political and personal connections of Madrano could hope to pull it off. With his unrelenting will and charisma, combined with his connection with Cesar Chavez, he was able to unite one of the UFW's top union organizer, California's Eugene Nelson, with local organizers, Raymond Chandler, uh, Miguel Sanchez, and Lucio Galvan, with financial aid from groups like the UAW and the League of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC, uh, gave hope to many who had worked in the Rio Grande Valley. In this poverty-stricken area, the need for union representation was obvious. Workers earned less than $1 per hour, and many held yearly incomes of $1,568, far short of the average 1965 workers. Yearly income of $4,658. The fight was simple. The migrant workers were only being paid 25 cents an hour in Star County, Texas, for the picking of melons. Frustrated, the workers demanded a buck 25 an hour and the right to negotiate as a union. More than 750 farmers shouting, Viva la Buena, went on strike. This brought the immediate response of Texas's latest strike busters, the Texas Rangers. Supervised by Cap Captain Alfred Young Ali, <clears throat> Migrant farmers began blocking trades, but were trains, but were arrested for abusive language. Leader Gil Padilla was arrested for disturbing a jailer because he recited the Lord's Prayer on the steps of a courthouse. Madrano knew that he had to bring attention to this plight. He and 66 others began a 450-mile march to Austin, and along the way, allies joined them. And by the time the march reached Austin, it was 10,000 members strong. And astonished, Cesar Chavez marveled at the success of Madrano's organization. Um, when presented with the estimates of the numbers, jubilantly defied Madrano as that crazy man. The visibility of the protest increased, but so did the steps taken to break it. In May of 1967, some union pickets gathered in Mission, Texas to protest the carrying of scab or non-union produce from the valley to U.S. Market, uh, markets. Leaders Reverend Edgar Kruger and Magdaleno Dimas were taken into custody by the Rangers and held their faces on the inches from the running trains as it raced by. A few weeks later, the Texas Rangers uh, arrested Dimas with a subjugation so fierce Demas was hospitalized, and uh, for four days he was in a coma with a brain concussion. And x-rays revealed that he had been struck so hard that his spine was curved out of shape. Madrono responded by keeping on the pressure. With five teenage girls protesting the picking of melons by non-union workers, Captain Alfred Young Lee and seven Texas Rangers showed up. The Rangers, of course, violently broke the protest, not realizing that an ally of Madrano had uh, captured all of their actions on a movie camera. And actually, it's a funny story because, and I'll break from this because we've got a little time. They were filming it, and uh, when they, they got the abuse, and quickly they changed the film and put it up and then like buried it. And while one guy was doing that, another guy was reloading the camera with them so when the ranger saw them, because they were in a car a hundred yards away, the ranger comes over, grabs the camera, exposes the film, and rips it out. So they think they've cleared all the evidence. And Madrano didn't know about it. He gets arrested. He gets sent to Brownsville to go to jail. He's found guilty. And when he comes out of the courthouse, his allies come up to him and say, how come you didn't show the film? He's like, what do you mean? Well, they had the film. It goes into... Uh, they were just escaping. See, that's what I get for being casual. <laughs> what, are they, what do you call it when you go against a decision? You fight. No, but what's the fight called? Appeal. When they appeal it, uh, this appeal goes all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States of America. 
and because of the decision in the case of uh, Medrano versus Ali, uh, because of the ruling in that decision, basically the Texas Rangers were forced to change the way that they deal with um, protests. <laughs> um, Riding a crest of success, Medrano returned to Dallas in December of 1970 and turned his energies to solidifying a fragmented Mexican-American community. At first, he met with little success. Groups of 40 might gather at a bingo parlor to listen to his pleas. Basically, these were elderly women. The main reason for this is that the majority of the Mexican-American population did not want to upset the apple cart. They had so little and didn't want to lose it. The status quo served them, even if it kept them poor. From his prior experiences, he went to build uh, intra and interstate uh, relationships with many peoples and many groups. However, this struggle led to little success until, and this was 1970 up, but then in a moment of 1973, a police officer, uh, Daryl L. Kane, basically uh, took a 12-year-old, two brothers um, that were breaking curfew. He said they were breaking into a FINA soda machine. He took them and he wanted to break the 12-year-old. He said that he emptied all the barrels. It was a lie. Uh, he puts the kid in the back seat. Well, he missed one. Let's say he placed the child in the back seat of his car and said, "We're going to play Russian roulette uh, in an attempt to intimidate the boy, not realizing that there was one bullet that was chambered, and he, the boy was shot, and he later died from his wounds." This provided the cause celebra that united the um, Dallas Hispanic community. As you can see, there's a bike that was turned over and set on fire. Um, uh, Medrano leapt into action. Uh, meetings that had numbered in the tens turned into hundreds, and by the end of June 1973, they numbered in the thousands. George Martinez of Dallas Legal Services claimed, this is the first time I've seen middle-class Americans get concerned for the Chicano. We had money from Pleasant Grove, Irving, Mesquite, with other areas that we never would expect to get people concerned. Watching the allies such as Ed Polk of Dallas Legal Services and Richard Menchaca of Dallas's Mexican American Coalition, Medrano did not hesitate to utilize the personal and political networks that he had created to broadcast news of the growing Chicano movement in Dallas. Uh, the Chicano movement basically was a political and cultural movement among Mexican Americans that have been spreading from Crystal City, Texas to Los Angeles throughout the 1960s. By the 1970s, the fledgling uh, Chicano movement could be seen in the growth of the Brown Berets student group uh, at campuses such as the University of Texas at Arlington and other campuses across the state. <clears throat> this was a militant group that openly confronted issues affecting the community. The issues fought against were lack of opportunity for Hispanics, poor schools and health care, the Vietnam War and police brutality. Uh, the public uh, generated the agitation of Madrano and his growing allies combined with the exposure of police abuses increasingly brought Chicano issues to the middle class citizens of Dallas, a class that had for far too long been content to remain on the periphery now demanded that America fulfill its promise to all citizens. And on March 9, 1973, uh, Medrano led a group of more than a thousand persons at Rivershawn Park. He had not only successfully organized Dallas's Hispanic population, but demonstrated a boldness that through boldness comes strength. Following tactics uh, learned at the UAW, Medrano fought for the rights of Mexican Americans by fighting for the rights of all. Nationally, he utilized his charisma to advance the Democratic candidates that included George McGovern, Jimmy Carter, Senator Ted Kennedy, and Senator Robert Kennedy's presidential uh, candidacy. 
as well as fighting for the inclusion of homosexuals within the Democratic Party. His public-minded and charismatic children were excellent alter egos of their father, turning the family into an informal political machine that was to make Dallas history. His son, Roberto, challenged the establishment when he participated in the election for the Dallas County School Board in 1972. Though defeated, uh, he, he won for it. He won it in 1974, making him the first Hispanic chosen for that position. Another son, Ricardo, was elected the first Mexican American of the Dallas City Council in 1979. His daughter, Pauline, served as the Democratic Party precinct chairwoman from 2005 to 2013. She was on the City Council from 2011 to 2013 and served as Dallas's uh, mayor pro term and became the Dallas City Treasurer. His grandson, Adam Adrano, has also served on the Dallas City Council and he still might be there. And there's also a junior high named after Pancho Adrano. Uh, Madrano's life respects, reflects a resilient ten uh, tenacity, forever faithful to his union philosophy of egalitarianism. He did not hesitate to use personal and political connections to further his causes, and in so doing, advance the rights of all. Any questions? Um, and by the way, something else that I did include that actually is kind of very crucial to this story is that when Madrano was four years old, his father was arrested, taken to jail, and disappeared. Uh, and they go to the cops and they're like, you arrested our father. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. Uh, basically, Governor Ann Richards, uh, during her tenure as governor, reopened the case to try to find anything. Wasn't able to find anything. So he kind of knew about police abuse. Any questions? Where was Little Mexico? Can you place that? Little Mexico is basically a neighborhood that was destroyed. There's a little sliver of it left, kind of over by Deep Bellum a little bit. It was totally divided and smashed by the creation of good old Rogers oh, and, sure. oh, what's the other one? What's the one that cuts from 35 to 75? You got good old Rogers this oh, way. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. Anyway, that uh, neighborhood, as well as um, a very um, prosperous uh, black neighborhood, both fell victim. Good old Rogers. I have a question. I am from the Dominican Republic, and I never heard about this um, Medrano, and you said that he went there to educate people? Yeah, the UAW. What kind of education, and why? No, 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 because there, in, uh, it was in 1968, 1970, uh, there was a lot of talk about um, election fraud going on down in you the said 68 or 58? 68. Ah, 68. 68, 1970. Mm -hmm. So, so he went there, there to do exactly To basically over, help be an uh, election judge and to help oversee that and help teach you know, the Dominican Republicans, you know, this is how we go through the process. Mm. And he spoke Spanish fluently, and indeed one of the things that was a tremendous help to me, and I am so thankful that a historian did it. Um, there's a whole series on YouTube that was done by this guy out of the University of Texas at Arlington, where he went, I mean, this was, a lot of it is based on an interview with Pancho Madrano while he's still alive. And this was done like, in the 1990s, I think. Um, and of course, you have to corroborate it, you know, make sure that what he's saying is true. And so, you know, a lot of stuff, you have to check newspapers, you have to, you know, verify. But it's interesting hearing a lot of it in his own words. Any other questions? It's interesting that there's like this movement from being the outsiders that are I mean, he's sort of this generation that's the outsider, the agitator, and then this family lineage becomes part of the structure. Yeah. 
Oh, um, by the way, um, the oops. Here, uh, Ruther, like I said, he uh, helped form the UAW with his two brothers, and we talked about how they did succeed at the sit down and strike. Well, just one week later at Ford, Ford once again used their union toughs, and they beat the crap out of both him and his brother, and they weren't able to get anything from Ford or make any advancements with the UAW. Was, was that the Ford Service Department? Yeah. Or the Ford Security. Basically go out and hire a bunch of thugs. I appreciate learning about him. I was I learned a lot about Cesar Chavez when I was in college and the Rio Grande Valley, but I've never heard of him. So this is appreciate yeah. your sharing that with us. Well, thank you so much. And I'm glad that you know the city of Dallas also honored him by naming a junior high after him. Is there like an archive or anything? Has anyone collected his stuff? I've met his daughter. His daughter is still pulling is still very active. Uh, indeed, one of the things that breaks my heart is that I had another, I had an image file that they had given me of photos of Mentrano with like Bill Clinton and all the, and I'm like, whoa, wow, but while I was downloading all these images, apparently I wrote over the file, so. Probably, would you think that uh, labor archives at UT Arlington might have some of this stuff? Probably, because he did have a, a special relationship uh, with them because, you know, once again, that professor did film them. Um, um, and I'm sure, you know, if we weren't in a uh, state that makes it more challenging to try to get union archives, um, we would have very little difficulty finding uh, material about him. Do you recall the professor who interviewed him? Was it George Green by any chance? It was Jose Angel Gutierrez. Okay. Interview with Pancho Medrano. And uh, Gutierrez, like I said, he did a whole lot of voices um, that are in Dallas that were um, integral to uh, the Chicano movement during this time. And once again, I. I, I love the word uh, Tejano so much more than Chicano, but Chicano connotates the political uh, advocacy for Hispanics. So that's why the word Chicano. Whereas Tejano just means hey, one of us. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you all so much for your time. I hope you enjoyed it. The rest of your day and lecture. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.